All right, we're here with Chief Michael Wynn. And uh, Chief, uh, welcome. It's it's great to see you again. Likewise, John, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Congratulations and... on the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, you know, looking at this uh, in Pittsfield, uh, there's a incident. Um, Miguel Estrella, of course, um, was shot and killed by Pittsfield police on Nota Street. Um, you know, the, the community is... Um, you know, looking for answers. Um, you know, this is from uh, an incident that occurred in 2017. And we've had our conversation right. about uh, Daniel Gillis uh, in the past. And I look at this incident and say, wow, it's eerily similar in some ways. In I mean, some ways. obviously, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, differences, of course, but uh, man with a knife, um, mental health uh, issues, and then shot dead. Um, so I, I guess, um, one of the first questions um, I had for you was, uh, and is, uh, as far as protocols go, um, and this is something we were talking about before the podcast, that you wrote uh, protocols for uh, the, the City of Pittsfield Police Department when maybe there weren't necessarily uh, those protocols in place. But, um, you know, what, if anything, did change after, after Daniel Gillis? I think there's two questions there, right? So one is about the investigative protocols and then the other is, you know, changes or additions um, to training or, or policies after the Gillis incident. And I think I'll, I'll take them in reverse order. So um, in, our, in our internal investigation following the Gillis incident and our after action review, one of the things that came out that was readily apparent, we, we had not finished the rollout of our taser program. We had taken delivery of the last batch of tasers, but they were a different version than who were currently in use. Uh, and we hadn't completed the training. So we were still sharing tasers and several of the officers who were on scene at the beginning of that did not have them. Um, and the second thing is that at the time, only supervisors and commanders had access to uh, less lethal shotguns. So in the immediate aftermath, we completed the rollout of the taser program so that every officer on duty has their own. Uh, they're not swapping them back and forth anymore. We went through our inventory of um, pepper ball launchers because they actually are easier to train with and easier to maintain than the dedicated 12 gauges. And we made sure that every line car had access to one of those as another less lethal option. And we increased access uh, to less lethal shotguns to include beyond the supervisors and commanders, uh, anybody who has been assigned to the special response team or previously been assigned and was already qualified. Um, and then we dramatically changed our training. We implemented a program that has been recognized internationally from the Police Executive Research Forum called Integrating Communications Assessment and Tactics, ICAT. And uh, we pushed that down in, in all of our in-service. Now, this I mean, this type of internal review and evaluation is ongoing. We do it all the time. But even if we have done that, it's still dependent on being able to get to the equipment and get it out of the vehicle. And so it's time dependent. Um, an officer arriving on a scene who doesn't have the ability to access the equipment is still limited to the equipment on their belt. Mm -hmm. So um, the second part of your question was the protocols. And so that you, your question was, are our protocols in line with the statewide protocols for use of force investigation? And the reality is there, there are not statewide protocols. The state for, doesn't have any. They, they don't have. Providing guidance. Right. They don't have protocols for a high level use of force incident or investigation. And depending on where you are in the state, some, it's handled very, very differently. Um, some departments choose to turn it entirely over to the district attorney's office. Uh, but the district attorney's office, as you noted, they only have jurisdiction in a criminal matter. Uh, and unless some negligence, malfeasance, policy violation can be found, then it, it doesn't, you know, an officer's use of force doesn't necessarily meet the element of the crime. It has to be proven to be unlawful. Uh, other departments, particularly the larger departments, they separate them. They do an independent or an internal 
uh, analysis to look at the policies and the procedures and the training so that they can determine is there something that might or might not be unlawful. Um, most departments, at least most departments, you know, in, in 2007 when I took command, they didn't have anything specific. It, they would look at their use of force policy and they would rely on the supervisor report within that, regardless of the severity of the incident. And that just didn't make any sense. Um, prior to becoming the chief, I had had experience as either a, a supervisor or a use of force um, assessor, looking at a couple previous incidents we had been involved in. And the amount of time in, in both of those cases that the DA's office took to deliver any finding at all was in, in you know, months, in some cases, many, many months. And during that period of time, our officers were in limbo. They, they weren't allowed to return to work. They weren't allowed to say anything to their families. And so we took a look at what um, was happening in some of the bigger cities in the Commonwealth. And I had just um, recently completed an assignment uh, in 2003, 2004 with the Drug Enforcement Administration. So I took a look at what they were doing and we put together a separate policy and protocol for our high level use of force reportable incidents that laid out what we would do. And essentially, um, get, without getting into the investigative details, we don't duplicate and we don't want to mire or step on the DA's investigation because it takes priority. But we, we basically mirror them through the early stages and then take the what limited information because they can't share everything with us they have a responsibility and they're independent we take what limited information they can um, and we use that as the basis of our investigation to determine if policies and procedures were complied with training guidelines were adhered to and then there, there was um the law had changed between 2017 and, and 2022 and what i realized when i looked at the preliminary report was based on the use of force regulations that the Commonwealth promulgated last year, I needed it to include that as well. So they had to go back and take another run at it. So the state did adjust something uh, in, that, in that time. Uh, Pri it, this, you know, this probably would be a surprise <laughs> to many residents of Massachusetts. Prior to last year, there were no state laws regulating use of force by a police officer. It was we followed the overarching national standard, which was a Supreme Court case. It was case law. It, it wasn't even written law. Mm. Uh, the case is Graham versus Connor. It establishes the reasonableness standard. It's the way we're all trained. Um, it's the way I've been trained to train others. In the Police Reform Act of 2020, implemented in 2021, one of the requirements was that the Post Commission in conjunction with the Municipal Police Training Committee had to issue regulations, Commonwealth regulations, specifically dealing with law enforcement use of force. Those CMRs came out, went through the public hearing process in the summer, and I think they came out early fall of 2021. So we had just adjusted our policy to reflect the changes in the CMRs at the beginning of 2022. Hmm. And so this investigation, by the way, it is a preliminary investigation, and it's really um, interesting. I think um, the it's always an educational process uh, for the community in a lot of ways, because a lot of this is, as you can imagine, brand new to people. It's, it's new to the family, new to the community in a lot of ways. Um, you know, uh, if you've been in city government, maybe you've been through it once or twice, but the reality is, um, in every other in every community, it's different. It seems like so it, it you're is. doing this in investigation, but this is a preliminary investigation. It's actually not even the the final investigation. It, it's um, not that, concluded. Yet. It's not concluded. And and in this preliminary, it looks as if, uh, according to the protocols and policies, um, the officers were not at fault. I'm not sure if that's the right terminology, but. Um, but that that's on the basis of the evidence that was available to the force investigation team at the time they drafted the preliminary, it appears that the officers complied with the relevant policies and procedures, training guidelines and the Commonwealth regulations regarding use of force. So then the question is, 
how do we avoid uh, this from happening again? And, and, and it's interesting because when you really get into the details, of course, things happen fast. Right. Things happen very fast. Um, and, and so everyone you know, wants to come to a certain conclusion. Uh, now there's a, a push uh, once again for uh, body cameras uh, for police officers. That's one thing that I think that especially a lot of politicians can kind of hang their hats on. Is that a solution that actually gets to the heart of, of the issue? Um, the other thing is uh, more mental health support. Um, you have 90 officers about, right? Isn't that uh, uh, just, under, just under uh, in, in that ballpark? So, you know, as, as you're looking at this and trying to understand, okay, how do we create uh, maybe a department uh, in, in administration to try to uh, better reflect the needs, you know, just tell me what you're, you're, you th what you're thinking about this and how to approach it. Because I, my concern is that you go with body cameras and then everybody gets a solution and they think they've solved the problem because right. it's kind of this um, yeah. uh, tangible thing that's right. been done, but does it really solve the issue. There's a lot of folks on the NAACP that are, are saying the body cameras are, are not the solution. I, I think the body cameras are a distraction from the underlying issue here. And, um, you know, we, we talk about this within the department and within the administration. If somebody could propose a solution where police officers weren't going on crisis calls at, at the outset, we'd take that in a heartbeat. We'd take it in a minute. Um, but you've got to, and we've worked really hard in the last several years to improve that capability for the for programs we work with. I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. You know, you've really got to wind the clock way back to um, the decisions to essentially to deinstitutionalize and to move to community care for mental illness. And it, you know, it predates my time in government service, it predates your time in government service, going way, way back. Um, but we built this community caretaking mental health model that is based on partner agencies and their ability to maintain a, um, a competent qualified staff to deal with a population that at least in my observation over the course of my career um, based on a lot of different factors has dramatically increased uh, as far as numbers and in need the the actual you know types of and I'm not I'm not a psychologist, but you know, I would defer to my colleagues from the Green Center, Dr. Michael. Um, but the types of diagnosis have have gotten more severe. And so, you know, I'm not and I'm not suggesting we go back to institutionalization at all. But um, so those decisions were made, and then you went through a period of time of shrinking budgets, both in government and in the private sector during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And at some point, just before I got in law enforcement. We, we got to this 911 driven system where no matter what the issue is, you call 911 and somebody's coming. I, I think uh, uh, Colonel Tommy Grady was at the last police advisory review board meeting and he pointed out in the final, in his final comments that in the Commonwealth, that's the law. You call, we got to send somebody. Um, and then one of the things that I don't think people realize, and you know, we can re-examine this. I've tried to re-examine it in the last couple of years. But most fire departments and EMS departments have standard operating procedures that they will not go in on a scene of violence or with a weapon until the police have gone in and have declared the scene safe. So we find ourselves in this perfect storm of somebody observes somebody in crisis, they don't know who else to call, they call 911, that prompts a response. The default response is the police. And then, you know, the police are going. Um, so we know this, do we observe? And you know, I, I can't take any credit for this. It came from the outside. Um, we had been trying to figure out for a long time because the, uh, I'm gonna mess up the abbreviations now. The, the program for emergency response, mental health stuff was kind of retooled slightly about 10 years ago. Um, and the Breen Center, be, was officially designated our official partner for mental health stuff in the community. But they didn't, they, the, the change didn't come with any funding. They didn't have a, you know, the law changed, but their staff didn't change, their mission didn't change. 
Um, so it took a couple of years before our first co-responder, Mr. Collins, figured it out. And he, you know, he essentially said, I'm going to embed myself with the police department. I'm going to figure this out. Uh, and working with Mr. Collins, we saw a dramatic reduction in our transports for people in crisis. We saw a dramatic reduction in uses of force. Um, we were able to successfully resolve many situations uh, with an edged weapon. Um, well, he was with us. He was with us for about six years. And um, then he decided, you know, it, he was, he, he'd had enough. He was going to leave. And that left the void. And that was right around the time um, you were leading the council. And we really struggled to figure out a path forward. Um, it, I'm not, I'm not going to get it. We couldn't, we couldn't build the program in the department because we wouldn't have access to some of the records. Um, we couldn't just necessarily bring somebody on with the city. Uh, the jobs didn't exist. The job descriptions didn't exist. And again, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have access to the records. So the first thing we tried was contract employees and that wasn't going to work for a variety of reasons. So then we went and um, reached out and, and again, reached out to our partner agency, the Breen Center, and they had to get creative. Um, but by subcontracting with the Breen Center, we actually went from one co-responder to two. Mm -hmm. But two co-responders is, you know, about 30, you know, 40, 40 some, between the two of them, 40 some odd hours. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. So I, I look at that and, you know, I guess one of the questions, because <laughs> you, you're, you're in this situation where there's a concern that there's danger and, 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 and a lot of this is, is being disputed in the community and, and the family um, is, is disputing, I think, even with the, um, whether or not there's this term civil commitment. Right. So that's something that designates that it's a mental health crisis. Um, if, if it is, uh, deemed civil commitment, how is that treated differently right now? If you get a call today and somehow, and, and it's indicated that, that this is, um, this is a certain designation, is, is that dealt with differently? So, um, th this, this is a evolving area of Massachusetts general law because we, we issued, we, the Commonwealth Post Commission issued the use of force regulations last year. And we immediately got pushed back that the language around civil commitments wasn't clear enough. Mm -hmm. um, so taking another look at that. Um, and that, that kind of breaks out into two separate areas. So the first is if a doctor, physician, clinician, or a judge issues a section 12, and we get the call, you know, there's, we issued a section 12 on this subject. They send us a copy. And of just paper. so people understand section 12 is. I'm sorry. It's chapter it's one. Okay. It's chapter 123, section 12 of the Massachusetts general law. And it's a, it's a very brief and vague section that says if a capable, competent person issues this order, that person shall be transported to the hospital by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, it's essentially an arrest warrant for a non-criminal offense. Mm -hmm. Um, so normally we, we communicate with the Breen Center about that. And we had some conversation during the debates around the formation of the Police Advisory Review Board, because that was exactly what happened uh, in one of those cases that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, crisis team issued a 12, we had to go. It, it's a warrant. We can't, we cannot not serve it. Um, and the case law on that in the Commonwealth is also very vague. But that's basically what it says. The Supreme Judicial Court said it's a warrant. <laughs> Um, the other way a section 12 can happen is that a police officer can initiate a section 12, take somebody into custody, bring them to the hospital, sign the 12 themselves, but then they turn the, the, them over to, in this case, the crisis team, and they make a second evaluation and they either decide they want to hold them or they release them. I was going to say someone clinical has to sort of be involved there, right? Yes. Uh, but to, in, so in many, point. in many cases, we we initiate the 12, we get them there, they do a quick little exam and they just release them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's above our, our level of care. And we say, you know, we're going to bring them to you and, and then that it's in their hands. Um, but the requirements for an infield section 12 are pretty stringent. Mm -hmm. um, the person has to be actively engaged in self-harm or serious threats directed towards himself or somebody else or completely incapable of making an, an informed decision about their treatment. Um, and again, I, I can't get into the details of the investigation, but you know, 
to police officers and the medics on the scene didn't think that they were there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that's and that, yeah. that is part of the, the dispute. You're, the right. the Pittsfield Police Preliminary Investigation said that that, that this was not happening. Uh, the family is disputing, saying that there is uh, that there was uh, self harm uh, taking place um, in that. So um, so there's a, a difference there. But um, but as far as I wonder if if that were the case, when there is someone with a knife, you know, and and there's a clinical person there who's in that position, you st you still have to you know protect yourself. You still have to the off you know the officials and and the people around. And again, um, you know that level of of danger of has to be measured at that at that moment and it's it's all happening fast but i guess that's that's my question if you're the clinical person how do you <laughs> how do you deal with a situation when there could be a danger so i think we we need to be clear about commingling um some of the information or facts here right so sure. let's let's use a hypothetical instead mm -hmm. so we go on a a call that comes in for a person in crisis and there's a co-responder available um it really and it's really going to depend on who the person in crisis is because over the past you know seven years in total and the past year and a half that we've been you know building the new two co-responder model similar to their predecessor they've really learned to recognize some of the names and establish a relationship and in some cases they'll they'll come up on the radio and say i know that person um I saw them recently. I've got this, you know, tell the officer, stay back and, and they'll go. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, they'll say, I know that person. Uh, I'm going to hang back, tell the officer I'm around the corner. Uh, in some cases, they'll, you know, coordinate their arrival so that they get there at the same time. Now, in that case, the officer is responsible for the co-responders safety and security, but the co-responder is, a, is, responsible for trying to establish the rapport. Mm -hmm. And that's generally the way it works. Um, and, and we're very successful with that. Again, we resolve many, many instances safely. That's different than somebody calls and says, there's a person in crisis, they're armed, they're gonna hurt themselves or someone else. The co-responder's not, not gonna go. They're gonna wait for the officer to go. Then they're going to wait for the officer to say scene secure you can come on up and then there's going to be a transfer um and again we, it, there wasn't a co-responder available so that for for the purposes of the current situation that that's moved but that's ideal the the other way this could go is the officer responds and says the scene is not secure right i'm here i have a subject they're armed they're actively in crisis then if a co-responder is available it, ideally what the officers are going to do is establish a position at a distance use the time that they're they maintain that distance to access some of that equipment we talked about previously right. mm -hmm. and then try to get the co-responder up to a place right. of safety where they can then try to establish rapport um, but those require distance and time right yeah you you, you guess you got to have that time. And it seems like in this case that the time wasn't there, you know, as you're thinking about this, the other thing is like, cause we're all looking at this and, and, and Monday morning quarterback saying, okay, well, you know, what, what if you were able to give him more space, you know, and of course this, the officers were in the street um, on a notice street uh, at that point. Um, not saying that you can't stop traffic necessarily, but again, I mean, it's, it's getting kind of tight in that situation but is there a possibility of a further protocol saying okay you know is, is there a way to give that uh that uh, subject more space uh, and and again i don't i don't have that answer but is that something that is the, being considered so under the principles of the icat program the the variables that we try to account for take advantage of our time if we can use more time but as you said you know we don't always control the time distance right either don't close the distance or do what you can to you know retain. because the tighter you get 
right. the more the more you're going to sort of disrupt or or you know cause uh, an action to come back right it, well there's that but the Possibly. tighter you get you're exposing yourself to more danger also of course right? yeah. Yeah. yeah um and so it's time distance and when possible barriers right can you put something between uh the subject or the, the involved the person in crisis and you um you know and again i can't get any details about the current investigation it, it they tried to control the time they tried to control the distance um they, there wasn't there wasn't an option for them to use some of the barriers um the they were they were you know looking to deal with mr australia but they also had active traffic behind them um and they knew they had active traffic behind them mm -hmm. and um then there's the district attorney investigation and again we kind of hit on this but i just i just want to you know from your understanding understand what that means because i feel as though maybe there's a sense in the community that okay well this is the police inv investigation it's internal and of course it, from the outside you're going to look at that very much and say well that's the that's the internal investigation of course it's going to be maybe maybe biased toward the officers in, in support of them because it's the department but then the da would be sort of this outside body but again it's about criminal um uh responsibility right. at least that's it's how i understand it and, no, and that, how it that, has been and right. i don't know if that's under understood as to right. what the community is thinking right, right now their their responsibility is to examine the incident from the perspective of was a crime committed um i'll share this with you um i had the opportunity and and i, I am i am well aware that this you know division between the internal investigation and the distrust of the internal investigation and our ability to investigate ourselves and the gap to was a crime committed that's not well understood and mm -hmm. um you know it's not the way every state does it so um i think it was i think it was after attorney general healy was elected but before she was sworn in um she was on a listening tour and she stopped in pittsfield and we spoke for a while and i suggested to her this this is an issue we have some familiarity with it the attorney general's office should create a unit to come in and take over high level use of force investigations take the locals out of it um she thought it was an intriguing idea <laughs> nothing ever happened she's like hey chief that's a great idea <laughs> uh we'll, we'll i will see. tell you that in other states that's how they do it yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll see you again when I'm running for governor. <laughs> uh, no disrespect, of course. I'm just, but uh, not to be flippant. But I mean, it is it, it 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 is difficult because you know these incidents they happen. Um, you know they they, they do happen, but um, you there there's a there's kind of a um, a, a process that happens. There's there's uh, the family, of course, uh, is distraught. We're we're all um, just. You know, taken aback, of course, and, and sad, and and uh, going through all the different stages. But then, and this happens with shootings too. You know, we, right. we, you know that, and, and there's a community outrage, and then we have meetings, and we have conversation, and then and then and then at the end, if the real question is, what is the action? And you know, you as the chief, you sort of have uh, uh, tools to work with, and then in order to address issues, then you need the administration, politicians, the state, others to sort of give you those additional tools. And I think what I'm hearing is that uh, additional support with those mental health uh, support um, uh, representatives, you know, who would be uh, part of the, you know, part of the team, it, uh, more of that could be helpful. So, any, so. Anything we can do to expand and increase community based mental health interventions is, is going to be helpful not just in cases like this but in a, a wide range of um crisis calls where an armed uniformed police officer should not be the first person on the scene um it's it's not necessary but in the absence of another resource it's what's there mm -hmm. um, i had a conversation it would, it would have been early in the pandemic we were dealing with uh, some crisis responses particularly um external you know we're dealing with some of the population in springside park 
And I had a conversation with uh, Fire Chief Sammons. I was like, you know, Tommy, can you you take some of these calls for us? If we shunt them over to you, can you send a medic out? And, uh, you know, he was like, well, what are we talking about, Chief? You're talking about, you know, six, eight calls a week. I was like, Tommy, we're talking six, eight calls a shift. Right. It's it's right. it's it, it is by far the most common call for service um, other than like traffic stuff that we don't yeah. So that's interesting. So I think it's a it's I mean, and, and you've got the data. Right. So, you know, you, you got something to work with. And so then really the question um, and, and this will be the question for, um, you know, any mayor, mayor tire or any mayor moving forward, uh, city council is to look at that. And, and we heard about this so much after George Floyd is reimagining what this, whether it's the police department or a, a community response team, whatever that looks like, you know, reimagine so, it. So we've, we've had some internal conversations in the, and actually they started before the Estrella shooting. We've been having this kind of conversation um, really since we changed the co-responder program you know, what should this look like? Where should, you know, how should it be funded? Should I take more of my funding from the department and put it there? Should we allocate more funding? I don't want to get into the details because everything has been very tentative and preliminary and we're still kind of um, brainstorming. But you know, one of the things that I have to point out is it, it, we can do it, right? We can find a plan forward, but one of the issues we have as a community is there are not enough trained clinicians who are interested oh, in yeah. doing this work. Um, <laughs> Chief, you know, I work in healthcare I, and we can't find enough nurses. No. Uh, you know, there's not enough nurses. There aren't enough uh, just uh, clinicians out there. So during the pandemic, I was in a statewide meeting with the Department of Mental Health um, about this, about funds and resources for co-response models. And we were actually in there because, you know, they were looking at us for things to other departments to replicate. We were in the process of helping uh, Greenfield and Deerfield stand up their model. And not only that, I mean, it, it, in the medic, in the medical, physical, medical, it, there's a staffing issue. But in in I don't remember, it was it was the president of or dean of one of the colleges that trained social workers, and they they just came right out and said people who go to college for social work don't want to do this work. They don't want to mm. do crisis work. Um, and the question was, could they start a concentration for that? Because if you went to school and you go through your clinicals right. and your idea is that you're going to counsel somebody in an office, the idea of rolling out with the police to a person in crisis at three in the morning is not attractive. Right. Um, it's a diff it's, it's, it's a specialization. Yeah. And there are very, very few people who are willing to do it. And even um, you know, among the ones who are willing, there are fewer still who are actually capable of doing it. Yeah. Um, and so we're exploring a couple of different models. I think, whatever we come up with, we're going to be dependent on our community partners. We just, we don't have the experience supervising clinicians uh, and it would take us a long time to get that experience. So, you know, we're still going to have to partner in this case with the brain center and health system uh, to find the people. Mm. I feel as though that th there is some uh, mixing and just, you know, let me know if you're short on time chief, but, um, but there is somewhat of this hybrid between the kind of the police officer type person that that personality and the clinician um you know to have that sort of combination you know to, because yes you're right social workers they they may want to work nine to five right. uh that sort of thing so i i feel like that that is worth the specialization that actually probably would be better pay um in addition uh you know to uh, probably working uh, on call and 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 so i i think i think it's worth a, a really solid investment in that uh, in that position uh, to attract uh, some people who would uh, not maybe necessarily normally think about that. So I, I, it's definitely, in my opinion, worth the investment, especially when you're telling me that when you've had these interactions and when you've been working with clinicians like this, it's really working. It really has. Yeah. You know, so that, that's, that's important. It is important. <laughs> we'll figure out a path forward. We always do. Um, you know, any, any words for the Estrella family? Um, you know, I just, I, I, it's, I, I can't imagine what they're going through. Um, and I know it's not on all your shoulders to, to, um, communicate to them directly, but, um, but, you know, just, you know, what would you say to them? I, I, I can't imagine what they're going through, you know, uh, you know, on behalf of the department, we, we all offer our condolences anytime one of our officers has to make a decision that results in a 
you know, loss of life or serious injury, it's, it's regrettable. Um, it's not something any officer ever wants to do. Um, being involved in a high level use of force or an officer involved shooting is one of the most traumatic things an officer can go through. Um, and so when we offer our condolences to the family, you know, I'm also worried about our officers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, um, for sure. And uh, we definitely respect those uh, men and women uh, who wear that badge. Um, and um, no, I mean, nobody, nobody wants to see this. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's one of the challenges that it's not easy being a police officer either. It is not. It is not. So, um, Chief, uh, I really appreciate uh, your time uh, coming in uh, to uh, the podcast. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep on this. And I, and I just, I feel as though this is a community conversation. Um, I think there continues to be um, education for people to know where decisions are made. You know, sometimes, you know, state um, officials need to be involved. Sometimes budgetary items, you know, that's all understanding how that works. So if it is going to be body camera uh, cameras, if that's a possibility, or even those that starts in the budget process and, and so forth. And so, um, so I think, you know, being involved and, and advocating, at those key times, and you know, you've been in a lot of budget here. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> have. The year. So, um, so keep on keeping on. I think we have a lot of people who do want to see good solutions um, to to um, avoid these types of things in the future. Uh, but uh, some things are unavoidable. Um, but um, but I think you know we, we need to keep the conversation going. I agree. Thanks, John. Thanks, Chief. Good stuff.